Welcome to Pill Talk Podcast, the podcast that gives you your daily dose of medicine, something you need to be motivated and inspired to live at your full potential. Today, I have a special guest. I have Dr. Candice Cooper Lovett. She is a therapist and owner of New Creation Psychotherapy Services in the uh, South Atlanta metro area. She specializes specializes in infidelity recovery, situational violence between couples, and as well as sexuality and sexual issues. So, Dr. Cooper, love it. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? All right. All right. Thank you for coming on. Yes. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So let's jump right into it. Let's get a little bit about your background first and get a buildup of who you are before we jump into the services you provide. So if you don't mind, um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what school you went to and where you come from. Yeah, so I was uh, originally born and raised Buffalo, New York. So uh, I went to the University of Buffalo for my bachelor's. I was, you know, I would say high school, but unless they're from Buffalo, they wouldn't know. But I went to Hutch Tech, uh, which is um, one of those schools you had to take an IQ test to get into. Uh, So uh, undergraduate was University of Buffalo. And then from there, my master's program was from Syracuse University in marriage and family therapy. And then I lived in Philly for a couple of years. I uh, went to Drexel University, it used to be called Heinemann University, and I got my PhD there. So that was what 2008 when I started my doctoral program, lived in Philly for a couple of years, went back home to Buffalo, did my dissertation, finished that up. Then 2014, moved down to Atlanta, uh, where I got my first job as, uh, I was clinical director in New York, but I got my first job down here as clinical director. Nice, nice, nice. I just came back from Atlanta. I love Atlanta. It's a great oh, yeah, place. Busy. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> it's it's a, a good place, especially business-wise. It's, it's been definitely uh, a blessing so far. All right. So what made you want to choose to become a therapist? Um, or what pulled you into that career field? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, of course, I didn't mention that. My in undergrad, I was a psych major. So high school... I think somebody came to one of my classes because I was going to try to be a physician, a pediatrician to be exact. Mm -hmm. Um, But then it shifted for me. And so, you know, somebody came, she was a psychologist, a developmental psychologist. And I was like, hmm, maybe I might like developmental psychology. Come to find out me and kids is just is just not my thing. So uh, when I got to college, I was able to kind of hone in a little bit more what I wanted to do. And I was uh, I'm a McNair scholar. Uh, so it gave me an opportunity. This is basically a program for, um, first generation or low income students, uh, college students to, uh, who want to pursue their PhD or MD and help them on that track. And so with that, I was able to get an opportunity to kind of figure out what I was passionate about. Um, and a big piece of that was domestic violence and sexual abuse, assault, the assault piece, the sexual abuse piece didn't come until graduate school, but I knew that I wanted to serve uh, families who had suffered from some form of intimate partner violence and the children who had witnessed it. And so it was a personal thing for me because I was a child that witnessed domestic violence uh, between my parents. And so that's what kind of led me down that track as I really start to think about it. And the sex therapy track was also another thing. I also, I always been interested in sex from more of a, um, a biological standpoint, like I'm a nerd. So, (laughs) but just really gaining the full understanding of sex, how it works, what's happening in our bodies physically and biologically during that process. And then, you know, the sex therapy thing just came from there and I enjoy talking about it too. So that's kind of how I came into this work. Nice, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, That's very interesting. As a kid, I also saw um, domestic balance, but not with my mother or father or anything like that. But well, family members like going to their houses and seeing mm-hmm. it and like how yeah. I view things now. Like mm-hmm. I make sure I'm like, let's set boundaries. Yeah. Let's have like code words. If one of us get too hot, mm-hmm. be like, hey, put a pin in it. That means let's exactly. pause the conversation and then yes. we can come back to that later. But absolutely taking those timeouts and having I tell couples like what let's create a safe word when it's getting out of hand. Whatever that word is, use that word and learn how to take an effective timeout. Because some people just want to, they just don't feel like talking about it no more. And they're like, okay, let's take a timeout. And then they never address it again. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, we definitely going to get inside some of that. Because I think the people would love to hear some of your topics and tips to help um, 
I guess, stop domestic violence or Mm -hmm. be able to counsel and talk with each other in a more effective way of communication. Absolutely. Absolutely. Most definitely. And I got tons of tips. All right. Let's let's (laughs) dive into it. So one of the specialties you have, uh, since we are talking about situational violence and domestic violence, Mm -hmm. let's jump into that and figure out uh, what do you normally see uh, is domestic violence? Because some people have different views on it because mm-hmm. some people believe it is just physical. Yeah. Some, some people, people just verbal. It was like, what are your thoughts on it? Like, what are you? Uh, the couples that I have, like domestic violence is more of like an intimate terrorism situation where the person feels intimidated. They feel threatened. They fear fearful, all those things. And those couples I do not see because that is a dangerous situation. And usually with those types of things, you have to have someone seek um, shelter or whatever it is. But even in that, you got to have a safety plan. So I will not see a couple that has that situational violence, however, is more or less people who don't know how to manage conflict effectively. And so as opposed to us doing that, we put our hands on each other, but it's a mutual thing. It's not intimate terrorism when one person is overpowering or terrorizing another. We just both don't know how to really handle our conflict. So domestic yeah. violence is more like that power control. And I don't know if you ever heard of power control will uh, by Duluth, Minnesota, that created that will that speaks and breaks down the different areas of domestic violence, like isolation, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, the uh, financial as well, because people don't look at that either. And the gaslighting, which is a huge component of domestic violence as well. Gaslighting? Yes. It's like a form of manipulation. Uh, People with narcissistic personality and narcissistic traits use it a lot, make you question your reality. So, for example, uh, they could have did something hurtful to you and you remember and recollect that they did this thing. But when you address it with them, they'll pretend as if it never happened. And it begins to it happens so much over time that it makes you question your own reality. But it's a manipulative ploy. Oh, so the abuser pretends like it never happened, but the abusee is like, no, I I understand. I know what happened. Yes. But then at some point they start to question if it actually happened. Like, well, did it happen? Like if you black my eye, you did black my eye. Like, well, no, actually I'm just giving hypotheticals. Yeah. You, you walked into my fist, you know what I mean? Or the cupboard hit your eye and you just don't remember. You know, and so the person starts to question like, oh, well, did that happen or did it? You know, they they don't really believe themselves anymore. Oh, yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's a biggie. All right. So when you have a situation like that, when somebody come in there and it's situational violence between a couple, mm-hmm. um, how do you address it as the counselor or as the therapist? And what kind of tips do you give them so that they can try to go ahead and like, um, fix the issue and work on their communication? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, I have them sign like a, it's a contract I made up because I couldn't find one, but uh, sign a contract to promise that they will not utilize any physical force during our time in therapy or beyond, obviously. But that's the first and foremost thing that I have them promise me to do that. Uh, Secondly, I give a lot of tools on conflict resolution on how to resolve conflicts without physical force. So how to communicate effectively, because usually I often say that the problem is not the problem. The problem is the problem. The couple or the person is not the problem. It's the problem itself and how we handle it. Mm -hmm. So I tell them like the goal is to, as a team, work together to solve the problem. So now we're not looking at each other as the enemy. The problem is the enemy. So how do we work together to solve that problem? So I kind of shift, you know, it's about a matter of shifting mindset. And I do some enactment exercises where I have them do um, active listening, like I statements and reflexive listening. So I statements is that I feel blank when you blank because blank. And then I add the extra layer of and this is what I need. And their partner has to paraphrase what they heard them say. And they cannot offer a rebuttal or response until that person feels understood. And we just go back and forth. It slows down the process and they gain a full understanding because oftentimes people try to agree with each other as a po- as opposed to trying to understand two different things. So I don't have to agree with you. I can understand you, though, but I don't have to agree. <laughs> and they get caught up on the agreement like you're not understanding because they're not agreeing. I understand you. I just don't agree with you. Yeah, that's a that's a big thing right there, because mm-hmm. I think that's in a lot of relationships. You say something you want someone to be on your side. You want them to understand uh, what well, you want them to agree 
to get mm-hmm. past it. But it's like, well, my viewpoints on this subject or this matter isn't yours. So let's agree to disagree mm-hmm. and move exactly. forward. Yes, absolutely. And some people don't like that either. Like, let's ad- agree to disagree because I feel like it's kind of like the easy way out. But it's like sometimes you just hit a, a role where it's like we are on two different wavelengths. So how do we at that point, we have to create some form of compromise. Mm-hmm. So both of us won't be at 100 percent, but, you know, it's OK. We both had to do some bidding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK. Mm-hmm. Um. So another one of your specialties I see is sexuality and sexual issues. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a lot of things going on with the LGBTQ community. Yeah, yes. I think I got all the letters right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Yes. But um, what are some of the things that you address with that? Like, do you help people identify their sexuality within themselves or something? Yeah, it's, it's a, <clears throat> you know, sex and sexuality is so vast. Like when I got into the work specifically like sex therapy, it's a whole other world in itself. So you got um, BDSM, which is like bondage. Um, I'm getting the acronyms, uh, sadism, masochism, and uh, dominance. There we go. Uh, So it's that world, it's the world of kink. You got, um, you know, inorgasmic issues, erectile dysfunction issues, people who are trying to define themselves in their own sexuality and their sexual self, bringing out their sexual self, healing after, because sexual abuse and assault is one of my specialties as well as healing and reclaiming your sexual self after, you know, sexual abuse history or trauma history. So like I said, the sex world is very vast. I've had several different types of cases um, as it relates to sex and sexuality with couples and individuals. And I've also had polycules, uh, throuples. Uh, people what is that, if you don't mind speaking about that? are people who are in a relationship of three. Or okay. Four. Yes. So I've had those experiences too. So it's, it's just a multitude of different things that, uh, come with sex therapy and sex and sexual issues. And so it might be people having anxiety about sexual performance, uh, porn addiction. I don't really like the word addiction or sexual uh, porn compulsion, sexual compulsion, things like that. Because sometimes infidelity ties into those things as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a whole world. It's a whole new world. I felt like I was a fish out of water. Um, my first... <laughs> My first case was just incredibly difficult. And my sex therapy supervisor was like, gosh, she, you know, she's like, you got fed to the wolves right away because it was not an easy case at all. All right. So with the sexuality, do you help? Like, how do you help them? Do you help them talk through the issues? Do you help them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, what kind of tips do you give them to kind of if you because it's so vast, right? And whatever you what you just said is so many different things that we can go into. Mm-hmm. But if you don't mind, just so that mm-hmm. I can get sure. a little clarity and sure. my audience as well, mm-hmm. can you speak about a case? You know, and sure. what was it? What was the outcome? I'm trying to think about a good case. So a case I had, um, this individual had um, masochistic things. So a masochist is a person who likes to receive pain or humiliation. A sadist is a person that likes to give it. So he was a masochist. He liked to receive humiliation, uh, but he also had a fixation with his penis size. So he liked to be humiliated about his penis size, but at the same time, feeling the way about his penis size. So he felt like it was too small, but he liked to be humiliated about it being too small. And the thing that made it kind of um, add an extra layer was that women who look like me, petite, Fair, like more fair skinned black women, he liked to have them tell them those things. So uh, when he sought me out, I said, so why did you seek me out? <laughs> because, you know, in my mind, it makes me feel like you just want me to humiliate you as well. Uh, but what came from it, and he did have some issues with me. And, you know, and my supervisor was like, you know, um, are you comfortable with him seeing you as a sexual object? Because that's what you are right now. You know, and so that was a challenge. But so the big piece of it was the challenge of having a healing relationship with a woman who he typically likes to humiliate him to be a healing and healthy. woman. And so that in itself was a breakthrough when it got yeah. to a place where he said, you know what, after our sessions and it sounds, you know, from the outside looking at it, it can sound a little bizarre. But he's like, I don't masturbate anymore. So that says that now when I come to you, it's specifically 
for therapy, for, therapy. For, for healing. Yes. Yes. And that the relationship in itself told him that this is this. It doesn't have to be this thing that humiliates me. It actually can be healing because it came from a trauma where a person that um, they were with was humiliating his penis size. Yeah. So he took that very thing and made it an arousal point for him. Oh, that was so his way of healing. Yes. Yes. So it, it was a lot of times correcting and saying, you know, some reality talk like we cannot compare it. Would, you would have to literally line up every man on the planet yeah. to compare your penis, you know, because it got it became a fixation and we had to work through that. So it got to a point where, you know, I always tell people the goal is to fire me in a good way, because that says to me that you got a good handle on things and you know how to cope with the things that you were struggling with when you initially claimed to see me. Nice, nice. That's a good way to put it. To mm-hmm. get to fire, hire me to fire me. Yes, yes, nice. yes. Because I know we have succeeded. Fire me means you have a successful um, termination versus I'm mad at you or I said something to them that they didn't like. Or it's a number of things why people quit. Or it's just a wrong time in life and they have too much going on. But a successful termination is like, hey, I think I'm good now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man, that's an interesting story yeah. and a good breakthrough how he was able to confront that issue and was able mm-hmm. to like heal in some way, form and fashion to move mm-hmm. forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Most definitely. And it was great to see that healing process break through and come through and that it wasn't, uh, you know, this issue was costing thousands of dollars at, at that those chat lines and stuff that stuff yeah. costs money so it was good it's like okay i'm saving money i'm not you know <laughs> what i mean my marriage is good it's not because all those things were at you know at risk of losing yeah yeah that, i guess that's that's an amazing feeling to be mm-hmm. in your craft to be in your field and see someone heal on the other end and being like i'm happy that i was able to make a positive impact in your life mm-hmm. and you can let some of that trauma go and move Absolutely. forward Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the part uh, that is rewarding because I just look at our, you know, we are the tool as therapists. uh, And at the same time, you know, we can be the catalyst for change because the person I say, I'm just a flashlight in a cave uh, or the passenger and they drive it in their car. Uh, I'm the front seat passenger, but Mm -hmm. you know, it's your, you have the answers ultimately, but you just need somebody to highlight some things that you just didn't see before. Definitely. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to speak about how you were able to come in and speak with businesses and corporations to make them uh, a better company. If you mm-hmm. don't mind, can you speak about how you're able to provide those services to all the businesses out there? Sure, sure. And it's like more of a, a consultation thing. So with this one was a staff uh, retreat where they just needed they had to they want to build morale, um, and especially amongst coworkers. So we had did a lot of stuff on like, commu- excuse me, communication uh, where I had, you know, it's one exercise where you have people turn back to back and one person draws the, the picture while the other person describes the picture. Mm-hmm. So that's a good communication exercise, like some stuff I do, you know, with cohesion, connection, um, not to say that people will be best friends, but it's just more or less for a better work environment. So that's one example. Another example is uh, a private practice reached out to me and they had um, both white and black clinicians, but they were finding that the clients that they served only wanted to work with the white therapist. And so they wanted to have somebody come in to help to kind of revamp uh, or market toward a population that will also want to work with their black therapist as well. So it was kind of having to strategize and figure out what that looks like or how they can implement that into their practice that serves a multitude of people that could, you know, be serviced by the therapist that they had in their practice. All right. All right. Mm-hmm. So um, those little things like that. So like I said, that's on the consultant side, which I don't get a whole lot of. I get it sometimes with the organizations and things like that. Yeah. Now, a lot of workplaces need that. Um, I'm a manager at my retail store. So one of the things I tell my team is like, listen, we may not be best friends, but we will be friendly here at the workplace. We will mm-hmm. make sure that we keep a good energy. Absolutely. No matter if we get the work done or not, mm-hmm. or all the work done or not, we will try to make the best out of the day, make it as, as enjoyable as possible because mm-hmm. nobody wants to come in 
and look at the schedule and go, damn, I got to work with this person again today. Exactly. Exactly. Because work related stress is real, you know, and even it has an impact on relationships because I did a, a talk for an organization of um, these are corporate workers, but they had these were workers that were always on the go and it was having an impact on their marriage. So I had to give like some pointers and tips on how to, you know, keep their marriage going, you know, being intentional about not allowing, you know, distance and time to um, interfere or diminish their relationships. All right. That's a great segue into the next thing. Since you talked about distance and time, work life balance. Mm -hmm. So obviously you're a busy woman, you have mm -hmm. the business, and then you're dealing with a lot of different personalities that you can uh internalize. So how do you have this work life balance or able to relax after having to, you know, mm -hmm. counsel uh people all day? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Self-care. That's why, I, you know, I'm an advocate of self-care about putting self first. Uh, like I said, not from the space of pushing people on the back burner, but it's like, OK, let me make sure that I'm taking care of me. Uh, so if that means like going and hanging out with friends or my sister or, you know, just doing stuff or watching, you know, even if it's something simple as watching like favorite television show, you know, and spending time, with, you know, husband and son and, you know, just having an opportunity to get out. And, you know, me and my husband, we still try, even with the baby, it's different with a baby, but doing date nights and things like that, you know, our little Mexican spot, get a little margarita or something, you know, but just to unwind. And I have to tell my mind like, okay, no nope. work is done, you know, especially working from home. Cause since all this COVID stuff, I've been doing everything virtually, Yeah, you know, so I make sure that I'm big on energy and cleansing my space as well. So I cleanse and close out every session so that none of that energy from those sessions is coming into my house. <laughs> Cause I'm serious. I'm big on that too. Cause it will drag you down. Yes. Yes. I know working from home is definitely a little difficult because at least when you go to a building, you got a, a door that you close and be like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So exactly. I guess well, for you, like you said, you before you stop, you close out the whole session and be like, mm -hmm. that's yep. it. Exactly. Let put that energy. Boom. It's closed. You can't stay here because sometimes, like I said, it's, it can uh, definitely take a toll on you. It can if you don't take care of yourself and, you know, uh, vicarious trauma. Burnout is such a common uh, thing in this field. Yeah. Amongst other fields, too. But it's it can be a lot because you're literally a vessel taking on people's problems, listening to people's problems all day, every day. I mean, I work three days a week, but at, at a moment, though, I was working like five, six days a week in my business until it got to a point where I could sustain and do just three days. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Nice that you're able to cut back on some of the work to find mm -hmm. that work life balance. Absolutely. It's so important because once again, we are the tool. If I'm not taking care of myself, I'm no good to no one. <laughs> That's and real. That is very important. A lot of people miss that because, you know, a lot of people want you to pour into them. Definitely when you have a good energy, when you have a good spirit mm -hmm. and you have to tell people, listen, for me to pour into you, I have to pour into myself. So Absolutely. you got to give me a moment. <laughs> Absolutely. And anything I pour should always come from my overflow, not from my main cup. That cup is for me. The things that I give is from the overflow. And when I don't got no overflow, <laughs> I can't give you what's because <laughs> if I'm giving you my cup is empty and now I have nothing to give my own self. So yeah, no, we have to replenish ourselves for sure. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So uh what do you see new creation um psychotherapy services going at in the next five or ten years? What do you see the future for your business okay. and uh your consulting? Yeah. Um, well, future wise, because now I transition what, at the beginning of the year into a group practice. So I have four clinicians that work under me. Uh, so I might cap it at about a good five, six. I'm very particular about who works under me. Uh, so, you know, continuing to grow that, uh, doing more, you know, because COVID kind of messed things up. But I used to do like workshops, still doing workshops when my therapist does groups, uh, continuing to do that, doing retreats you know, all those things, because I've um, currently 
getting certified to become a tantra killer. So I'm going to add that to my business as well, doing tantra uh, for individuals and couples uh, because it's, you know, sexual healing is also spiritual healing. So that's another piece uh, that I'm thinking about growing and expanding on the creation side. On Dr. Kupalov's side, I've always had the uh, goal of being on television. I've done radio. um, so I've seen you've been on a few things down here. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) A few magazines, to name a few uh, yes. Soar Online, Sheen Magazine, uh, yes. Yahoo Lifestyle, mm-hmm. just to name a few if anybody wanted to go look you up on those. Yes, they can They're contributing to some different platforms and things like that, which has been great. And so now is the missing piece. I mean, I did like a segment on the news about texting or something like that a couple years ago, but that was my only television like live experience where people actually saw it. You know, some people have sought me out where we've done like you know, little cameos and things like that, but nothing really came of it, to be honest. So that's the next goal for me is to be on like a major network doing therapy. Okay. Nice, so we'll see. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Five, 10 years. We'll see what happens. You know, you can also join the Spencer's Written Wednesdays where I have me a live Wednesdays and it's an audience on my YouTube okay. live channel where you can interact with the audience. So if you're ever interested in that. Okay. Don't be scared. That's not- Oh, yeah, most definitely. That sounds good. You know, I, I know it's easier when it's uh just my voice versus you see my whole face. But it, it, it made me used to it when I was in my uh, training because we had to record ourselves doing therapy, which was kind of weird to watch yourself back. Uh, so I got used to it doing that. So at least with the live it's just the live. And that's that I might watch it back to critique myself and see what I could have did better because that's just me. But, you know, I think those that would be a great opportunity too, most definitely. Yes, yes. So if anybody want to reach out to you, can you let them know your website, Instagram, social media handles so that they can get in contact with you or ask you for any of your services? Sure, sure. So for the therapy side, it's a new creation psychotherapy dot com. Uh, Instagram is a new creation PSY. Twitter and Facebook are the same. Uh even with the other side on the Dr. Cooper side for the consultant and the supervision uh, in speaking, that is drcooplove.com, Instagram, Dr. Kuplov, Twitter, Facebook is the same handles as well. All right, all right. To everybody, uh, to everybody, thank you, Dr. Cooper Lovett, for coming on, giving us the daily dose of medicine to yeah. inspire and live at our full potential. We really appreciate you. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me. Hey, no problem, no problem.